Wow. All God's people said? Tremendous. Never heard that song before. Um, but I believe that um, anybody, anybody could preach after that. You were, you are, you always will be the risen Lamb of God. Tremendous, tremendous message and song. Thank you for uh, that, and thank you, Kevin, for uh, the preparation for uh, worship today. Love that song, Blessed Messiah. Name above all names, Emmanuel. Amazing. Uh, appreciate all, all of that. Take your Bibles, if you would, and go with me to the book of Daniel. We'll be there in a few minutes, but let's go to the Lord uh, in prayer this morning as uh, we look into uh, his word. Father, we pray that with the songwriter who wrote these words so well in a prayer that you would open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, to say that we love him. Open our eyes, Lord, and help us. Help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We, we want to see Jesus. And not just to see him, Lord, we want to be changed into his image. We want to be like him. We want to be used by him. As we sang and as we heard the words of the songs this morning, our, our hearts are moved with compassion. Our hearts are moved to adoration toward all that you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. We sing out how, how great thou art. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start by asking a question this morning, as I, I do oft times when, when I speak, is, is to ask the question, what is the appropriate relationship between ministry in 2019 and the world around us? In other words, how, how are we to be positioning ourselves uh, at our ministries here at Avoca Baptist Church, and, and how should you be trying to position yourself in your neighborhood, uh, in your community, uh, in, in the county that we live in, in, in the country that we live in, in this culture in which we live? Where do you fit in? What is your role as a believer uh, in Jesus Christ? We've been discussing this a little bit in our last Sunday School se series with Ron Hutchcraft and uh, his series on evangelism and all the, the details about how do we evangelize, what are some tools that, that we can use in that. Uh, so that's been, been very helpful. But I think historically God's people have, have often struggled with this question about how do we fit in in this world in which we live? How do we position ourselves? You know, and on the one hand, there are those who have put as much distance between themselves and the world as possible. Uh, frankly, uh, oftentimes you think they hate the world. They're angry at the world. They're, they're frustrated with the world, and they have made maybe the critical theological error of assuming that when John said that we are to love not the world, that he meant that we're not to love the world of people, which is not what he was talking about. He was talking about not loving the world's philosophies and all that's caught up into that culture that ignores God. But this group often thinks that you're supposed to distance yourselves from unbelieving people and even despise everything and everyone associated with the world. This group often comes across as hypercritical, hyper-pessimistic, and with these folks, if you mention the arts, 
Uh, their mind is going to gravitate to some of the most bizarre examples of funding from the National Association of Arts and then talk about everything about the arts as if they are bad. With these folks, if you mention literature, music, or entertainment, they're often very critical, uh, very negative, very cynical, and very angry. And that's the way they position themselves in the culture in which we live. And too bad, that's often the way they come off to the very people that we're trying to minister to. With this group, if you mention the social needs or concerns in our world today, there's some very judgmental attitude that's going to surface. The hungry or the homeless, if that comes up, the first thing that comes out of their minds is, well, why, why don't they just get a job? Now, why don't they just get a job? If you mention the AIDS crisis, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, well, that's God's judgment upon these people. Label this extreme. Those who, who stance toward the world is very angry. It's very negative. It's very cynical. It's very hateful. It's very judgmental and pessimistic. We might call this group maybe having some truth, but no compassion. And I have to wonder how many times that as church and as fundamental churches, sometimes we come across in the world in which we live in this angry, cynical manner. What about the other extreme? Is there another side of this ditch? And there certainly is. You can label that group love all aspects of the world extreme. And people on this side of the ditch would have very little concern for philosophies and strategies. They, they love the world to the extent that you can't tell any difference between them and the world as a believer. Is there that possibility? Yes. This group has absorbed the world's music. They've absorbed the world's literature. They've absorbed the world's entertainment. And in doing so, they've absorbed many of the world's values, their philosophies and ideals. And if you mention to them any social concern, they'll have some interests here. Hungry people need to be fed. Homeless people need to be housed. But there's really not too much interest in going beyond that. And so the long-term spiritual needs of people are ignored. And the life-giving message of, of the cross remains out of sight. And in many ways, this group, this group is ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of the cross because the idea that human beings are sinful and need, and need of a savior and that salvation is available only through the cross work of Jesus Christ to this group that's viewed as very negative, it's viewed as very embarrassing, it's narrow, it's bigoted, and it's backward. And so label this stance very optimistic and positive, but, but very shallow, very undiscerning, unable to see and to stand against the contemporary issues of the day. And so, yes, they have compassion, but very little truth. And if the fundamental church comes across as the first extreme that we talked about, the liberal church comes across as the second extreme that we talked about. And the reason I'm raising this question this morning and these two different scenarios is because the book of Daniel, I believe, gives us a marvelous set of answers to the question that I posed at first, how are we to position ourselves? What's the appropriate relationship between Christians in 2019 and the culture in which we live? Daniel was a man who lived all of his life in a pagan culture. In this book, it's very, very clear about how the dominant culture of the day in Daniel's day was going in a direction exactly opposite in the direction that Daniel was going. 
It was anything but a culture that honored God uh, in heaven. So on the one hand, you have Daniel who's living in this culture, but you don't find Daniel crawling in a hole somewhere waiting for the rapture. You ever feel like that? It gets so bad. And, and it's just like, come on, Lord, just beam us up. Just, just beam me up. This would be a good day. But Daniel, Daniel didn't find himself as, as the culture he was in and, and as he was there in Babylon just finding a place to hide until the Lord brought him out of all of this mess that he was living in. So there's no hint in the book at all but that Daniel was angry about this. There's no hint that he was fed up that he was hateful, or that he was going to march into the king's chamber and demand that the king become a full-fledged follower of Jehovah and declare Judaism as the official religion of the day. We do not see Daniel doing that. But on the other hand, Daniel also did not allow the Babylonian culture to swallow him up. He didn't lose his distinctiveness. He didn't compromise his beliefs. He, he didn't compromise his testimony. He didn't stay away from representing God, even though it was not the majority view that he was living in. It was truth. It wasn't truth without compassion. But it also wasn't compassion without truth. He had a balance in this. And Daniel was very much like a man who would come after him 550 years later, uh, not just any man, but the man, Jesus Christ. I want to talk about that this morning, and I've titled the message, Daniel, Jesus, and Us. How can we look at Daniel's life? How can we look at Jesus's life and realize how would God want us to be living in 2019 in the Babylonian culture in which we live. Isn't it almost Babylonian? It is. How are we to be positioning ourselves to be people of influence and integrity? So just a little bit of background here. I'm assuming a knowledge of the book of Daniel. We studied it a couple years ago in Sunday school. This church, most of you have been here a long time. You've heard about Daniel. You've heard about the situation. But just let me give you a little background before we look at this. The short version of it is this. Daniel was a Jewish teenager that was deported to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And this book is all about he and some of his friends and how they were able to maintain their faithfulness to God even though they were in a situation where there was great pressure for them to compromise their beliefs. And the good news is the story actually covers more than 70 years and that from the beginning to the end we find God helping and enabling his servant Daniel to be a man that honored him throughout his entire life. So we learn from Daniel that it was God's plan, it wasn't God's plan to immediately transform the entire culture. We talk about nations sometimes, well, this is a Christian nation. Listen, nations aren't Christian. People are Christian. People live in nations. So it was not God's plan, even in our day, to immediately transform the entire culture, but it is God's plan to transform a group of human beings, in this case, Daniel and his friends, who established and cultivated a relationship with God and then let them and their lives be a light in a very dark place. What does he tell us? Let your what? Light so shine before men. Right? I was thinking about the transformation that, that is happening in the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My dad used to shake the bed, make the bed, and to bed we go. But it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
I think about Romans 12, 1 and 2. When I think about their lives and what happened, I think about, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not what? Be conformed to this world, to this culture. Don't be conformed to Babylon. Don't be conformed to the culture that we live in, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your what? Of your minds. Read the word of God. Study the word of God. Let it transform your life. Don't be conformed to, the, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the great thing about Christianity, right? We're not just, it's not just an outside makeover. God changes us from the inside out. You know, we're not just remodeled. I'm remodeling my home, you know, <laughs> my apartment to move into. I'm like, wow, this is a mess. This is a lot of work when you get up to around 60. But that it's not just a makeover that God does, does with us. He changes us completely from the inside out. Amen? And so as he's doing that with you, as he's doing that with me, he's saying this needs to have an effect on the culture in which we live. So there's two characteristics. I was playing around with notes last night, wanted to hand you notes. My computer was not cooperating. But there's really only two points I want to make this morning, and I think you can remember that. Just two things, two characteristics for godly living in a troubled world. Look at Daniel chapter 1, and the first one is this. Daniel was a man of influence. Daniel was a man of influence. And what I mean by that is, is Daniel looked for ways to bring his relationship to God into his relationship with other people. All through this book, we see, we see Daniel impacting other people for God. For example, what happened when he and his friends were deported to Babylon and offered the privilege of eating at the king's table right in chapter 1, look at verse 8 with me, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Here's a perfect balance of what I was talking about earlier. Daniel didn't de demand... Daniel didn't go into the king and demand that everyone in the kingdom follow his dietary laws. He wasn't angry. He wasn't mean about it. He wasn't harsh about it. He goes in and asks if he cannot defile himself with the king's food, with the king's drink. All right? So he saw that situation in the culture in which he was living as an opportunity to be an influence. He's saying, let me bring the truth of God and the power of God into the situation. And he used that event to showcase the glory of God. And we know the story. We know what happened. He didn't eat the king's meat. He didn't do everything that everyone else was getting all this food. But he ended up stronger than everyone else around him. And all you can say about that is, that's a God thing right? That's a God thing. And so Daniel showcased, because of his influence, the glory of God. What happens in the next chapter? Go with me to chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has this terrible dream, and none of his wise men can tell what this dream is all about. And so God reveals this dream to Daniel, and look at what happens starting at verse 26 of chapter 2. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven, he says. You can underline that, mark it down in your Bible. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream 
And the visions of your head as you lay on the bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, he says, the mysteries have been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than any other living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You see, here it is again. Do you see what's happening here with Daniel? Daniel is using this occasion in living in a pagan land and working for a pagan king as an opportunity to be an influence for God. Daniel took his relationship that he was having with God and brought it to the people in which he was living. And as you walk through this book, and we could go through chapter after chapter of this, and example after example, as, as you see Daniel really functioning as a godly entrepreneur, engaging himself in the world in which he was placed and searching for opportunities to take a stand for the Lord. He was on really a, a lifelong search for ministry opportunities around him. As Ron Hutchcraft would say, he was an ambassador. He was a spokesman for God. And you see, this is very different than the two extremes we were mentioning in the beginning. Daniel is not separating himself from these people in a mean, hateful, condescending, critical fashion. But he's not either nuzzling up to them as if to say, I'm okay, you're okay. I'm just living in this culture. God put me here. He deported me from my own people. So I'm here. So I've just got to blend in. He's positioning himself in such a way that he had great opportunity for influence. And is there application to that to us today? Oh, there, there sure is, isn't there? What about the questions we posed at the beginning? Uh, how are you positioning yourself at work? How are you positioning yourself in your neighborhood? How are you positioning yourself in your community? Have you fallen into either of the two extremes that we talked about, or are we looking for opportunities to serve? Maybe God has you as an engineer. And he's placed you with a group where you're the only one in your group that follows Jesus Christ. How, how are you going to handle that in your workplace? Are you frustrated about that and wishing that all of my coworkers, I wish all of my coworkers were saved? Wouldn't that be nice? That's heaven. All of your coworkers will be saved in heaven, right? Probably not down here. Sometimes we think, if we just get everybody saved here, everything would go well. Well, of course it would go well. Sometimes we think, well, if, if I could just be called by God to be a pastor and could work with Pastor Bill and Pastor Brandon, everything would go great. Talk to them. Everything doesn't go great. Some of you here are teachers. Some of you here are students. And God's placed you in a, in a public school environment. It's kind of like Babylon, right, Mark? Would, would we Babylon a little bit in a public school as a student or as a teacher? I guess, I guess the challenge is to be a Daniel in the midst of the Babylon. You don't need to despise those around you. You don't need to become embittered toward them. You need to be the best educator you can be, the most loving person that you can be. And when the opportunities come to take a stand for God, stand up and make a difference for God. And I've talked to some of you teachers, and I've talked about the situations that you run into in Babylon, and I know that there's challenges with that. But there's also opportunities with that. There's opportunities there to showcase the glory of God and to be an influence for God. I was at a training last week, and um, 
it's a secular training. And they were two weeks ago, we were in this, and, and they were talking about all kinds of things. This is um, called restorative justice training. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but, but a lot of the things that they started out with in this group were quotes from, they gave like 20 quotes to everyone around the room. You had to read the quote and comment on it. And a lot of these quotes came, and, and the author was unknown. And I noticed as I was reading these quotes of unknown people that most of them were biblical. That's why they were unknown so much. And it was a great opportunity to talk about those things, about forgiveness and about guilt and about the things that were being quoted about. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I'm in a secular setting being trained by secular people who don't know God who are quoting things from the Bible. Go figure. So it was tremendous to be able to be an ambassador for God, to be in a position of Babylon, so to speak, but to be able to speak to the truths that were being quoted in these quotes to unknown people. I'm telling you, I could have put a chapter and verse to most all of them. It's almost plagiarism, what was happening. So I trust that, that wherever God has you, whether it's in music, whether it's in, in, in schools, or whether you work in construction or, or anything else, that you see yourself as a person in the midst of Babylon with an opportunity to be an influence uh, for God. All right? Secondly, our second point. We're almost done. What time are we done? Does anyone know? Nine what? 35. Okay, we got five minutes. Good. All right. Got to move along. Daniel was not only a man of influence, but he was a man of integrity. And one of the great messages of the book of Daniel is that God is so powerful that he enables one of his children here to live faithfully for him with integrity in the middle of an anti-God culture for the long haul. Seventy years he does this working for pagan kings. And never once do you hear about him giving up or throwing in the towel. And never once do you see him lashing out to those in the culture of, around him. And I'm not saying that Dan was, was sinless. Daniel was sinless. He wasn't sinless, but we don't, we don't see a lot of sin in Daniel's life in the book of Daniel. And you compare that idea to the Lord Jesus Christ, what Daniel was as an imperfect man, Jesus was as a perfect Savior. We know Satan was in the wilderness tempting him. He comes out of that. His integrity is proven over and over, so much that the writer of Hebrews says he was tempted, what? In all points as we are, yet without sin. So he knows what our experience is, is like, which is why the Hebrews would go on to say that he was qualified to be our sympathetic, what, high priest. All right. So the message to us from Daniel, he lived 70 years as a person of influence and integrity, so can we. Daniel was a human being just like we are. And I would say this, if you're going to be a person of influence, you better believe that you're probably your integrity is going to be challenged, right? Your integrity is going to be challenged in the workplace, in the culture. I'm a manager where I'm at. I travel to Albany every month with a group of executives, and, and we go out to dinner, and we do this, and we do that, and we, we stay in a motel out there. And, and I find that every time that we go out to eat there in Troy, just above Albany, I'm being asked if I want a drink. Everyone I'm eating with knows I don't drink. And you better believe if you're going to be a person of integrity and influence, it's going to be tested. You're going to be in a position where someone's going to test that. And believe me, if you're not a person of integrity, you have no business being at that dinner with those people. Because integrity hangs in the balance. And we don't need 
Christians who are just melding into the culture and being like everybody else and then talking the Christian game on the side. I think Matt was, or Kevin was talking to me about that this morning. Somebody he works with that, that claims to be a Christian. He talks the Christian game, but he cusses like a sailor. That's an extreme. That's the liberal culture. That, that, that's not what we need to be in the culture in which we live. So how does this have an influence on us quickly as we close here? Does this have any implications to us as a church? Are we to be a church, a lighthouse in this area to influence the culture that we're in? Absolutely. Are we to be a church that would be characterized with integrity? Absolutely. So what opportunities do we have to have Daniel-like ministries in Avoca, in Steuben County? What opportunities do we have? Well, we have all kinds of opportunities. We have a block party coming up, right? Block party. What's that, what's that all about? We're trying to, we're trying to meld with, with the community. This year it's actually within the community, isn't it? We're, I, I think that's awesome. We're within the community. Here we are in an opportunity to be people of influence in the culture, in the community, and not just to meld into it and become part of it to say, I'm okay, you're okay. Right? We do these things every year. We want, oh, here comes a block party again. Here comes a WANA again. Here comes a VBS again. Do we really have to do this year after year? Well, look, the, these are our opportunities to be influential in the community in which we live, right? These are opportunities as we come to next year's Awana. Do we need to keep doing this? And again, I'm not saying we, need, we don't evaluate these ministries, what's good, what's better, what can we do? But if we're having these ministries to jump into that and say, this is our opportunity to influence our culture, amen? This is the opportunity that we have to be a person of integrity within the Babylon in which we live. So we pray and we ask God, look, change us. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. Change my heart, O oh God. I, I, I would be like you. Aren't you glad we have people like Daniel in the Bible? He wasn't a pastor. He, he wasn't a missionary. He was a person who lived 70 years in a pagan culture culture that had a tremendous influence on the people he rubbed shoulders with day in and day out. Look, we, we know as, as Mrs. Mead sang the song, we know that he was there for us, right? He was there in the past for the people of God who had to be obedient in difficult situations. He was there at the cross, obviously. As he was dying there for you, as he, as he was dying there for me, he was there. He is here. He is here this morning. Change us, God. He will be there in the future. It's great to be a Christian, isn't it? It's great to know the one true living God. Let's close our time in prayer. Kevin, do you have a song as we close? Kevin's going to come. I'm going to pray, and as Kevin comes, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to live in 2019. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word to see a man like Daniel, who was a man and a person of influence, and he was a man of integrity. And Father, we pray that we would look and ourselves as opportunities to have Daniel-like ministries in the workplace. To have Daniel-like ministries in the community, in the church that we serve. Pray to that end, Lord, that we would make ourselves available to be a part of what you're doing 